I'd like to welcome everyone here today. First off, I'd like to uh, say that it's a privilege and we're well pleased that uh, Senator Paul is here, that he has concern for us here in Corey County, and we greatly appreciate him and his staff. And at this time, I'll introduce Senator Paul. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Judge Executive Green. And, uh, you know, the last time I was through here a couple years ago, we talked about how can we make things better, and then I'm I guess I get concerned when I ask again, are things better that maybe they haven't changed enough? And I think some of it's a communication thing, that we need better communication. You know, we need communication between local government, federal government, but then also those uh, who are in the federal government that run different large agencies like forestry and uh, the National Park Service. I think you guys have a, an unusual community in the sense that uh, about two-thirds of the county or even more is controlled by the federal government. But I think it's important for um, me to learn about the situation, but also your government. We work for you. You know, we're not telling you what to do, you're telling us what to do. So we're going to learn from leaders in the community, leaders in the government, and, and from uh, citizens of the county too, what we can do better. Some of the stuff I think is really simple, and I don't understand why it can't be fixed. You know, why is a road closed? Why can't a road be opened? Why is government not responsible, you know, responsive to us? I think it's important that everybody know, myself included, that we work for you. It's important that the Forest Service and the Park Service know that they work for you. It's, it's not their land, it's our land. And our input and what we're for is, we all have the same thing in interest. Nobody wants the land to be worse, everybody loves the beauty of the land, but if nobody can use it, is it, is it, of, is it of value? If we have this great pristine forest and nobody's allowed in it, nobody's allowed to use it, Nobody can get to the parks. Nobody can get to the rivers. I'm impressed, like when I'm over on parts of uh, Lake Cumberland, how uh, they have marinas and they have tourism. They have people using the lake. You guys aren't quite to the lake, but you have rivers, and they're beautiful. Are people getting access for fishing, canoeing, kayaking? Um, could we get a you know big log cabin, bed and breakfast, or something built on a corner on a curve in the river or something where people would come? Could we do it in conjunction with the uh, railroad? And so I think what I'd like to do is start with uh, Judge Executive Green, and maybe you could go through some of the things that are working with the Forest Service and the Park Service, some of the things that aren't working, and maybe tell them some of the things that, uh, you know, if there's a problem with a road that's been closed a long time, see if they can explain to us why the road's still closed or why, why can't we open it, and maybe they can tell us what we have to do to figure out some of these problems. Okay. Judge Executive Green. Okay. I'll just take a few few minutes here. Uh, we have some individuals here that uh, will go more in depth about what we're talking about today, but uh, I'd just like to just give a little uh, viewpoint uh, of what we're looking for here in Macquarie County. Uh, as you know, this is a, a rugged, rough terrain that uh, generations ago that people uh, settled here and, and they've worked hard. And through, the, through our history, the logging and mining industry has been big. And unfortunately, the majority of it's been owned by outsiders that uh, really didn't have our best interests at heart. So after our mine shut down in the early 80s, we, we went into uh, uh, an economic slump. And shortly about that time in 1974, when the uh, Big South Fork Park was formed, uh, we had new hope. And we were made many promises, such as a, a lodge here in, in Kentucky and many other things. So that gave us some renewed hope. And... Uh, you know, the individuals here are hardworking, good, honest people, and all they want to do is be able to provide for their families. But they'd also like to be able to enjoy uh, the gifts that God has given them here in, in, our, in our natural beauty with the hunting and fishing and camping. And for whatever reason, uh, things didn't come to fruition like we thought they were going to, and I'm not sure if that's because uh, Senator Baker was such a tireless, diligent worker for Tennessee, but uh, it seems like most everything went to Tennessee. And even today, if you'll look, there are trails, there are signage, uh, there are roads, the activities that are going on in the park, 90% of them, when you get an email, it's about Tennessee. So the only thing we're asking for, you know, is we would just like to be offered a fair share of what Tennessee and other areas has. As you'll see in the charts that are coming up, you'll see the uh, proportion of land that's owned by the federal government. So therefore, our tax base is very low uh, when they only pay pennies on the dollar. So that handcuffs us right there as far as our budget and what we can do. We're just looking for economic development. We're looking for chances to uh, enjoy 
uh, God's gifts that He's given us with the natural beauty here. And, and that's all we're asking for. We're not asking for anything special. We would just like to have maybe just a little piece of the pie and just be treated fairly. As you'll see in the charts, there is no other county in Kentucky that is owned, has as much federal land owned as what Macquarie County does. So our budget, our resources are limited, but it, it's, it's not about picking at people or, or, or trying to bring up old wounds. It's just about moving forward. And uh, hopefully we can get the dialogue started and, uh, and we can be treated fairly. And, and we just, you know, we want to work with everybody moving forward and just give our people the opportunities where they don't have to move uh, northward to get jobs, Detroit, Cincinnati, wherever. And uh, that's just, that's what we're looking here. And today, hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on that today. Um, do you know where we want to go to next? Or? Uh, Deputy Nathan. We'll All right, Nathan. Um, we have a uh, PowerPoint presentation that kind of outlines the areas. Uh, I'm a school teacher until just recently, so I can't uh, discuss a PowerPoint seated. Um, our county, as you mentioning, is primarily uh, owned by uh, the federal government. Uh, here's some background. We're the youngest county in Kentucky. We were founded in 1912. Uh, 426 square miles of land area. Our population has dropped considerably. It's down to 17,465 in the 2017 census. Back when I lived here, when I was in high school, we were around 23,000 to 24,000. Okay. Our land is mostly owned by the federal government. Uh, the Daniel Boone Park, we have maps here, and there's a really large format one on the back table. 63% uh, of our county uh, is actually <coughs> the uh, Daniel Boone National Forest. 18% uh, is part of the Big South Fork uh, National Park, and then we also have a wildlife management area that is that is part of that, and then the Cumberland Falls Park is also part of the state land. So this outlines the uh, the tan area is the Big South Fork Park. The green is the uh, the uh, Daniel Boone National Forest, and so what we're looking at. We'll get to this in a moment, but we're looking at just actually a small area of land that we would like to have access to that would give us more opportunities for businesses along the northern part of Highway 27 and also along Highway 90. We have 273 acres of land total. Uh, the Forest Service portion equals to about uh, 172,443. Uh, the National Park Service has 18%. Uh, which equals to 49,269 acres. The Corps of Engineers also has a portion of it, about 4,000 acres. And so the total is around 82.5% uh, that is government land. So there, there are only 47,994 47, acres available uh, that could be used for development. Uh, the National River and Recreation Area is 196 square miles, so it's about one third, and it's located in McCray County. Uh, the next few slides will be pointing out some of the areas we're referring to and some of the issues that we've had. The next slide is referring to, uh, we have it listed as County Road 1295U. And so it was, it was blocked by the Park Service. And, and I understand that the area at the time had been flooded, uh, but we have the road crew to go and reopen the area. And so um, had some folks not taken the initiative of, of accessing it and getting it cleaned, um, I don't know how long that would remain closed. Those are the official closed signs. Uh, this is an area of land that the private landowners have actually been blocked on one side by the Forest Service and on the other end by the Park Service. Uh, three different families own land in this area, and it is along uh, Lick Creek Road. It's old Lake Creek Road, which actually follows the creek. And so, yeah, next slide. So this is the barrier that was put in by the Forest Service. And then on the other end of this, uh, it was blocked by the Park Service with, with a large rock. And so that area, again, three different families have land all along that creek. It could be used to uh, have cabins. There would be a lot of tourism opportunities there. But the folks literally cannot access their own land except by foot. Uh, the next slide will be showing um, a lot of the barriers that have been put up. A lot of our favorite fishing areas, uh, large holes have been dug, and those are allowed to fill with water. 
Those are called water bars. I think there's one of those in the photo, but you'll, you'll see a lot of these if you travel up and into the uh, areas around the park. And this is along Peters Mountain. This is what we really like, and this is what we would like to see more of. Uh, this is a this is along the top of Peters Mountain, which was inside the Big South Fork National Park. This area is actually designated so that you can ride four wheelers, horses, uh, bicycles, hiking, and so that's this is kind of our goal. You can you can do any of those on that area, um, and so in Tennessee you can ride four wheelers over over very large areas. There are huge recreation areas, and it draws in tons of tourists for. Uh, boy, if you've seen all the vehicles going back and forth hauling four wheelers, you know what a big draw that is. So we would like to see more of those um, because that actually would connect into Tennessee from the same road. And this is along the same area. Uh, that's a water bar that's been uh, where the hump of dirt has been dug to block the road. Um, this church, three of our local churches were absorbed by the Big South Fork National River and Recreation Area. And so we appreciate that you know the churches were, were, were allowed to continue operation. They only have to pay a land use fee, which is between $50 and $65 a year. Uh, but they were assured when they were initially absorbed that they would really not be affected in their operation uh, by, the, by the national park. But the folks at this church in particular were told to stop graveling the parking lot uh, because it was, it was a problem happening in the park. And then, and then they were also warned about a broken window, that if, if there was a broken window, it could be considered in, not sufficient to be inhabited. <coughs> so the next slides are going to show, we, I know that there were concerns from groups about uh, us asking for land. We were only talking about, like our largest shopping centers in our county only extend about 600 feet from Highway 27. So we're talking about very narrow strips. Uh, the railroad actually, you, you get to the railroad within 200 feet on a whole lot of the west side of Highway 27. So this is on the east side of Highway 27. There are actually just a few areas uh, that are not uh, already part of like the uh, Beaver Creek Wildlife Area. Okay, and this, this is National Forest land? Or this yes, is, yes, this okay. is the National Forest. And so th this would be land that you would want to sell, lease, how would it work? Yes, and, and I know that we've also done, in the past, there have been trades with local land that would be, that could be better used for industry and businesses, uh, so th that happens, or to be purchased. And if, is there a process that you know of, or an application process where you're in the middle of doing that? Do you, do you um, know how to do it, or we, we would need assistance on how to do that. I, I know on the nor far northern end, uh, a gentleman was able to trade some land. He's in the process of building a resort, which is what we're looking for, uh, along Bower Road on the north end of our county. He right. was able to trade some land to get access. Right. And so we're talking about tens of acres, not hundreds of acres. Absolutely. We're talking about the largest strip was about two and a half to three miles that we're talking about. And then there would also be some areas on Highway 90. Right. Uh, that could be accessible. And I will say that, uh, Erica, was this where we were told we could go FOIA if we want information? All right, so we called the Forestry Service to ask about this, and we were told from one of your offices that we want to know how to do this. How do we file an application for this? And they told us we could FOIA. That means that we could sue the Federal Forestry Office for the information. Now, that to me is an insult, and that's not the way government should work. When we call, or I call on behalf of the citizens of McCreary County and ask how to do this, you should be helping us. You shouldn't tell us, oh, sue us if you want the information. And that's the response we got, and that made me very mad, and if people hear that, that we have to sue government to get for information. I don't know if this is possible. If, if we could find out, just, we never do this? Is there a process for doing it? We're not talking, the media was saying, oh, I wanted hundreds of thousands of acres of forest. No, we're talking about... You know, several hundred feet. feet. Yeah, we're talking about 600 feet, and this is a community that could use a little bit of more commercial area. And I think, you know, I forget what the statistic was. It was like the government owns 600 million acres. You know, can we not give 600 feet back to a community to do something with? Um, I, I just wanted to make that clear. But, yeah. Yes, right after Judge Green was elected, the month after it came out in, in the newspaper about, or actually it was in a national magazine, McCrary County was getting again labeled as the poorest uh, county in the nation. 
And so we we are trying hard to change that. That is Judge Green's that is Judge Green's goal. Uh, to uh, we don't put up with those kind of designations. That's not how our people react to situations. Uh, these are additional areas that would be uh, areas we would be tagging for potential purchase. Uh, I think there may be one more. Do, of those. do you want to stop before we go yeah. on? Just because we're going to hit a lot of and ask the Forest Service: Is there a process by which land that's owned by the forest? Can either be leased or sold. Oh, there's an application process. Does this happen around the country? Yes, sir. yes, sir. And thank you, Senator Paul, for that question and others. Uh, there is a process for land exchange, as was mentioned. There's also a process for selling of the land. Also, a process for special uses on the land. And I apologize for the response that you got. That's not a customer service response that we should be giving. We will work with the county and others to outline the different alternatives for this and, and be glad to work with you on that. Well, we appreciate that. And yeah. hopefully, once we get this process going, we can all work together sure. on some things like this. And so is it common that land is actually, it, it, this happens around the country, different requests? Land exchanges are more common than the, the selling of the land. And so land exchange, they don't have much land, the land is already well, owned by the federal government. How would, that, yeah. would, how would that work? Is there land that could be exchanged for any of this? Do you guys know? May I speak up on that? Sure. Yes, yeah. absolutely. From personal testimony of friends that have had land exchanges, um, it's one-sided. You know, it's, it's never really a negotiation. It's if you guys want it, you'll, you'll trade, but then in return, a lot of times you ask for a lot more than they're giving. And so, in turn, it ends up being one-sided. And it never works out for the party trying to trade, where it doesn't seem to. And so, the trade, to me, is an unfair practice. Can I speak up? Sure. Between the archaeological and environmental surveys and everything that you have to do for so much red tape, it is really tough. I've sold land to the government 20 years ago. But uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, it's not worth fooling with, you know. It's so... Uh, on the trade part. On the trading part. Right. Doing, doing any of it, it's just so much red tape that you, you may spend a lot of money on environmental survey or archaeological survey, and you know what an arrowhead or something can do, right. and you spend, as a small business, $50,000, and then you have to... Right. It's just... Uh, and really see, we've seen this in other places too, like over on Kentucky Lake, they had to build a new uh, sewage plant because the sewage plant was, had too much sewage when it rained and it would flow into the lake and nobody wanted that. So they tell me they have to have an archaeological study and the local people tell me it's a racket that you're just paying money to and they find some arrowheads, you pay a hundred grand to a consulting firm, the consulting firms all get rich off of searching for arrowheads and you still put the sewage plant there eventually. But you got to waste time. That, or you got to count the pocketbook muscle, or all, all this stuff you got to do. But it, it makes it cost prohibitive to get anything done. And uh, I guess the other thing is, is if you don't have a potential buyer yet for it, you'd almost have to have it that the land could be sold, and we approve it for sale. And then when they find a buyer that would buy it, then the sale would happen, as opposed to if the, if the land trade stuff isn't working as well. But I don't know if that's possible. Could you apply to have a strip of land that looks like it would be good commercial land along the uh, Highway 27, but they may not have the money from the county just to, to buy it from you either, right, to begin with. Maybe we designate it as potential for sale, and then if they find somebody that wants to come in and put a commercial enterprise, would be, is it possible to do it that way, or it has to just be bought or traded for? Well, there, there's a process for this, whether it's an exchange, and, and on the exchange, you know, we have to do appraisals and get fair market value for, for what we're disposing and, and what we're acquiring from someone else. But on a sale, we would have to designate that, and we'd have to, all the land, the land, as you said, owns, is owned by all of the American people. So we would have to identify these lands as lands that we're going to offer for sale. And then that goes through a process, and, and anyone can comment on it. So we'd have to see what the, you know, what comes back in the way of comments. Right. And you'd say this is a common occurrence or a very uncommon occurrence? I'd say it's an uncommon occurrence to sell the land outright. Uh, and the exchanges are more in situations where we have a disconnected track of land, and, and we want to trade that land for a, a track of land that's contiguous to existing national forests. All right, and so it doesn't sound that encouraging that you know we're going to find a solution to this. But 
And so, how was the land taken initially? Was uh, were the landowners? It was bought. The federal government gave the landowners all money when all these parks were created and the forest was created. You know, I'm not sure, Senator Paul. Uh, in most cases, the land was was acquired as as, as willing sellers from the landowners. Right for two dollars an acre or something. Let's say again for two dollars an acre. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> dollar an acre. Yeah. But I mean, that's and I, I guess that's the other thing is, is we can think about things the way they've always been done, or maybe we ought to think about whether it ought to be done differently. Because, like I say, we have, you know, my staff tells me the federal government has 640 million acres of land. So we're not talking about getting rid of the Daniel Boone Forest. I think the Daniel Boone Forest is 700,000 acres. Could you not deal with 20 acres less or something on Highway 27? So, I mean, maybe we've set up the obstacles of either the land exchange or the sale that just aren't going to work. I mean, does anybody have an opinion on, you know, if the rules as they exist, it doesn't sound that hopeful for either sale or exchange. What do you think? It doesn't sound hopeful to me. And then the other part, too, that I would have to ask is if, you know, if we can move forward in that direction, then who oversees that, you know? Is that going to be something that the, our, you know, Daniel Boone National Forest says, uh, no, you know, we won't sell that. You know, what process is that going to look like? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, but as I think about this, you know, a, a special use of a property like this might be a better avenue than, than the acquisition. Okay. And, and what does that mean? That means the county put forth a proposal as to what they would like to see this land used for. Right. And, and then uh, let's go through the process of looking at that as a special use, much like we have with a right-of-way or a boat dock or, or whatever. So could a special use be that there's a pretty busy corner and a cracker barrel wants to locate? Can you do that or not? Well, that could be proposed, and it would be looked at, and it would be commented on through the normal process with and public does comments. it ever happen? I mean, does it ever happen that you can make something... I can't think work. of an example where it's happened right off. So but that's unlikely to happen. But see, that's the thing is, is that, you know, I know that's not the national, we don't, the forests aren't a place for Cracker Barrel, but this is the side of a highway and it's a busy intersection and the community might have 30 or 40 people that would work in the Cracker Barrel. And if the, you know, I mean, the manager, I mean, there'd be sure, money, more money in the community. And I just don't think we're ruining the national forest to give up a corner, a, a busy corner to give up, you know, five or 10 acres to put a commercial enterprise in. But if it's not going to happen, then we have to figure out whether we have to change the law to make it happen or whether or not we have to go to the Secretary of the Interior and see if the Secretary of the Interior can make it happen. Um, but I think talking to the public at large, I think this is a problem. I mean, we're, we're, we think we're getting, so we're trying to get along better and get to a solution. But I want to be realistic about this, that if, and, and if you're being honest with us, yeah. it's unlikely to happen under the current rules unless we change something. Um, but I don't think it's an unrealistic request, and there are people on one side that just say no ounce of land's ever being given up. But it's what about a hundred? I mean, six hundred and forty million acres. Can we not have back corner, you know, on a busy road to put up a Cracker Barrel or a gas station or something like that that would bring jobs to the community? Senator, I interrupted you. Want to oh, Senator Paul, can I yeah, add to that just real quick? It's talking about the special use. The water district currently has a special use permit where we pay $2,600 a year to provide water to our community, mm -hmm. just to bring that out there. Yeah. Okay. And um, I like the idea of thinking of a special use, but if it's never been done, maybe we could use a special use and ask and make that request. And it sounds like that might be the better avenue for trying. Since I, I, I would think so. Yeah. Um, well, just, you're in luck. I have that in my proposal. Good. Good. <laughs> All right. You want to keep going? Yes. I wanted to also mention that most of our youth have to move away to get jobs. And so my, I myself was laid off due to a school consolidation and had to move away. But we all tend to come back when we retire. Uh, and Judge Green taught me out of retirement. Um, but I wanted to quickly recognize we've got a fantastic group of students here. And so these are, these are some of our kids that we are probably going to be losing um, because they'll be going elsewhere for jobs. Uh, Mr. Friels, do you care to stand, sir? Fantastic. Uh, he's a teacher that's here with our group today. These kids have already gotten certification right here in our county. We have fantastic schools. Uh, Taylor Tucker has a nursing certification. Uh, Dylan Staley has a carpentry certification, and it's, an, it's a regional one for Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio. Laura Rollins has the same certification. 
and so does Tristan Collins and Zach Martinez. All those folks uh, will be graduating with certifications. We also have uh, those are the folks with carpentry. Cassandra Mitchell uh, has nursing certification. Austin Tucker uh, has construction certification. Is also going to be going into the Air Force. Uh, Johnny Reidner has welding certification. Devin Ball is completing the lineman school. And uh, also Jonah Starrett, he's completing his HVAC certification. So we want these kids to have jobs. We don't want them to have to move away and leave our county. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Did he stand already? Okay. Thanks, Austin. We have just like two more slides. Uh, these are additional areas that we have marked. This is a, a campground of the Sawyer Recreation Area on the western side of our county. Uh, and so this was originally uh, a campground, and so this is one of the areas that has kind of fallen into disrepair, that we would like to have access back to this. Uh, we're, we're, we're willing to maintain it. But a lot of our areas uh, have kind of ended up like this, in a, in a state of disrepair. So this is uh, park service land? Right? This, this would be within the, the Daniel Boone Forest. Okay. Yeah. So really you have uh, problems with road access with both park service and forest? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to try to go through some of those and get some reaction from any of them now, or do you want to do that in a minute? Do you have well, a plan? Public, I, We'll be addressing it all. Okay. No, we, we can now. Okay. Know. Well, I mean, like with the, what's the, Old Lick Creek Road. This looks like yes. it's blocked on both ends. One yes. end by the forestry and one end by the park yes. service. Um, do y'all want to make a comment on that particular road? Maybe not the region. I don't know if I have to ask the local people to answer that. Well, I know in general for, on roads for us, uh, I don't think we have any pending requests for special use for road access. We'd be glad to consider those. Okay, and we so what does, that, what does that mean? That means make an application to use and open that road by the landowner or the entity that needs to get to their property. Okay, and we have a number of those across right, the Right, but y'all have had interaction with either Forest or yeah, it has been, about this? It has been reopened repeatedly by county judge executives and also our, our actual county legal judge, Judge Winchester. Uh, and then after he passed away, the road was closed again. And it's been closed, what, now, last time for four or five years yeah, or so? Yeah, three or four years. But, uh, I mean, I think... <clears throat> They're aware of it, but I don't think anybody's telling them they need to fill out a form. Are people telling you to fill out a form? No. So, I mean, it's been going on for years, but I think the local forest and park service people know that they want the road open. But I don't understand why we have to be adversarial on this. Uh, is there a harm somehow to having a road open? I, I'm not sure on that specific situation, but we'd be glad to look right. into it and, and work with the county on this. Okay. But, but you can see how we perceive that as a problem, yes. that... that um, They've been requesting it, and no one's telling. This. Is this the first you're being told there has to be a special yes. permit or application? So your local people need to be told that they need to inform the local people that they have to fill out a form or something. But this isn't just here. I've had this in Lee County, Powell County, Wolf County. All any county that's dealing with the forestry service is having problem. And it's funny because see, I see this as so simple that we should leave this meeting and that road should be open tomorrow. I mean, unless you're telling me that, you know, we're going to, the bald eagle's going to go extinct because we opened the road, and I don't think that's true. These are roads, and I think they're actually willing to maintain some of the roads, they, they, right? Yes. The local uh, government's willing to make the road better, but uh, it's not just private land, but ultimately some of this land could be used for, for camping and different tourism and things. Um, can we get a comment from any of the local people, um, either park service or local forestry, on why the roads, why they can't get the roads open? Our local district ranger for the Stearns, Tim Reed, is here. Tim, would you want to? And your your forestry or park service? I'm with U.S. Forest U.S. Forest Service. Forest yeah. Yeah. I'm the district ranger for the, for the local ranger district. Uh, particularly on Lick Creek Road, there is a roadway that goes through private from Hickam Buffalo Cemetery Road down. Uh, it does cross National Forest and then crosses back onto Park Service and accesses the river area. The boaters they showed were block from the park service side of the gate was on the air side. Uh, the reason that was blocked because uh, it was determined 
You might have been down there on the river back down there. It turned into a jeep riding area. It turned into a in here, jeep what? riding, four-wheeler riding area on the park, National Park. Right. And it looked like a moonscape. There was, you know, mud bogs created, and we documented that. And, of course, the park closed their side, and we put the gate up on our side. We have had no request from any landowners to reopen that road. Nobody's come to us and said it was like Ver Verbal or written? No, sir. And, uh, and no, all right. But uh, and I get the idea that people do want it open. Yeah, there have been lawsuits. Yes. Well, I mean, if there have been lawsuits, you'd think that that would be a request that you've been aware of. Yeah, that's in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Other than, Paul, can I? Yes, sir. That's sort of the same question. Mr. Noble. Sure. Um, what is the process inside the National Park Service that, that you guys use to determine a new closing of a road? Because, and I'm asking because I don't know, and our community don't know, over the years, we had had different access points, you know, into the gorge. And then it seems that when a new superintendent is, and I'm not pointing fingers at our current one or anyone else, but it seems that when a new superintendent is hired, if they want it closed, they just close it. There's no petition to the people or no real, you know, discussion with the people about that road closing. It just gets done. And sometimes, you don't realize it until you receive a ticket on the other side of that line, you know. Now, I'm sure you put up a sign and maybe that sign was, you know, tore down, but what is that process? Well, I'd be happy to answer that, and um, thanks for having me here today. And I do want to say that to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that we have any Park Service lands that are restricting sole access to to property owners, and if that's the case, um, I, I'll, I'll continue to look at that and would like to know that. I mean, normally we can't legally restrict access to private property owners, so um, if that's the case, um, you know, I, I guess I need to be more informed about it. As far as closing, I, I, I wasn't referring but no, you weren't. I just wanted to address that while I had the open mic for a second. But your question is, um, unless there's an immediate emergency situation, such as flooding or a rock slide or public safety, um, or an immediate threat that requires an immediate temporary closure, we have a process of closing roads which requires a record of determination and there should be public notification, and there should be notification to the county and local officials. Um, so we sh and we should, it, with that record of determination, it's determining what's our justification for closing it, and it shouldn't be an arbitrary decision. It should be that there's, you know, documented resource damage, and this is the only solution, or it's going through threatened endangered species, or, you know, there should be specific reasons for that, and we have a specific And I guess going back process. to the whole idea that there are Jeeps going back there, people uh, doing four-wheeling back there, if that's a problem, couldn't, rather than forbidding access to the land and closing the road, couldn't you put a sign up and say, you can't bring your Jeep back here and have somebody patrol it for a while to see if you could give some tickets to people who are disobeying the rules? rather than completely closing off the access, you know, might be another alternative. Um, but it doesn't sound like there is good communication between whoever's closing the roads. And, and I don't think this is just McCreary County. I mean, I've, we've got four or five other counties. I go to these counties who are not asking for a lot. They're not saying, give us $20 million, you know, to help our county. They're, they're saying, can we not have a road open so we could have the possibility of developing the land in our county? I don't think it's too much to ask, but I also don't think it's just here. Uh, you know, I've got it in four or five counties in Kentucky that people, it's really like, they just want, you know, there's a trail there, and there, there's a, why do we have a, why do we have a, a, a roadblock across a trail? I just don't understand why we have to do that. Um, I actually think that letting four-wheelers on the land isn't destroying the land either. Probably some of these counties where you have four-wheelers uh, that are doing trails through some of the forests, it's actually become a big thing, you know, that, that people like doing that. Uh, so, I, I agree with you. Um, we should do a better job of communicating. I'd like to say it's the first time I've ever heard that in my career, but I can't say that. 
but we really do owe it to the local communities. And we're part of the local community. We feel strongly about that. And there really should be no surprises. If we want an area to be closed, we want everyone to know that and know the reasons why, because otherwise it won't be effective in the first place. So so we, we should be effectively communicating that. So hopefully out of this, we get a very clear process. So what forms they have to fill out or who they have to complain to, because I think it has been going on some, but I don't think that anybody's saying, oh, you have to fill out this form. And if you have to fill out some form, I think they're probably happy to do it. But let's hopefully move forward that, and some of this gets fixed. If the community really wants that, uh, that particular road open, let's, let's open it and then let's address the problem. But it, it seems a little bit uh, dictatorial that it's all coming from one side, from people who aren't elected by the local people. They are closing the roads and they don't get much say in, in, their, in the land here. And the American public owns it, but they care more about the land here than people who don't live here. I mean, they're the ones who have access to it. And um, so anyway, I, I think we can do a better job. What are we going to do next? Yeah, I wanted to quickly right. recognize that, that Tim Reed has been very helpful uh, as our, our forest ranger. And so he was at our tourism meeting recently, and he was going out of his way to offer help in us uh, in terms of getting permits and that <coughs> kind of thing. So we, we appreciate you for that. Yeah. I wanted to recognize that. Mr. Whitaker, I think what? you're next. Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Whitaker. I'm the superintendent from Macquarie County Water District. And uh, I, I got a presentation here for you that's going to show you some personal and, and professional experiences that I've had dealing with the Park Service and Forest Service. I was raised on Mine 18 Road and spent most of my childhood in, in and around Big South Fork, Blue Heron area. My family is a part of this land. My great grandfather, James Ross, is a coal miner, number 39, pictured at the train station at Blue Heron. To the left, third one up, all the way on the left, that's my great grandfather at the train station. Next slide. Pictured is the house of James and Polly Ross, located just outside the park. My family reunion for the last 32 years has been held at this house, house place for the fourth of, for every 4th of July weekend. It is 3.1 miles by road from the train station at Blue Heron. If you travel from here the way my great-grandfather did, it is 1.3 miles to the river at Devil's Jumps, just upstream from Blue Heron. My Aunt Betty Lou Davis was raised at Blue Heron. Her report card and other items were on display at the Little Red Schoolhouse at Blue Heron. Pictured is the house structure where a life-size picture of my Aunt Betty and her sisters is. She comes to our family reunion every year. When you push the button in the structures and to listen to the people living in the Blue Heron community, she is one of the voices you will hear. As a child and a teenager, I spent most of my playtime inside the park. Every summer I would fish and swim at the eddy hole. I would hike and play behind my house toward the river to a place upstream from Devil's Jumps, the same area that my great-grandfather walked to work in the mines. I, walked, I quickly realized interaction with the park service, park rangers, was not pleasant. They always made me feel as if I was doing something wrong. It was as if they were looking for any excuse to make me leave. Once I had a park ranger stop me on a bicycle as I was heading to my favorite swimming hole. He told me I had no place riding by myself and loaded me and my bike into his Jeep and took me home. Every year at our family reunion, we all go swimming at the eddy hole. We always have park rangers check us out. To us, it's something we have become accustomed to. We laugh it off and always return because it's our home. Today, I understand those interactions were people trying to do their jobs. Topics of discussion from people in our community is, why is the Park Service and Forest Service Rangers so difficult to deal with for the people that live in Macquarie County? I feel as if tourism in Macquarie County is not a priority to the Park Service and Forest Service. The access to areas, facilities, and trails keeps decreasing year by year. The overall maintenance in areas inside the park and forest service is in great need. This is key for our community's tourism. Roads and trails have been closed, shelters torn down, signs directing travelers to access scenic areas are not available. This is the Gorge Overlook, one of my favorite spots. Many, many uh, weddings have been conducted here. At one time, there was a large gazebo there, and uh, a lot of people would go there and, and, and travel inside the Blue Heron and, and, and go to this overlook. The, the, the Gorge Overlook burnt 
many years ago, and it stayed that way up until recently. I don't know when it was when part of it was fixed, but this is the fix. They basically quartered off this section of where the gazebo was, and go to the next slide. And you can kindly see when you go to the scenic view, this is kind of what you look at at this overlook. Go to the next slide. This is the rock face where you can stand and look over the river. Go to the next slide. And you can see what a beautiful view and area this is for, for, our, for our people and for tourists to come and visit. The train station at the Blue Heron, the concessions, as, as far as I remember, as long as I've been a part of that area, has never been opened. The bookstores and the vending machines have never been opened. I mean, there on occasions when they promote an event which the county is involved with, someone may open those at that one time, but for the most part, they're always closed. Some of the self-audio tours inside the structures are not posted for tourists to have an interactive experience. I know that was a big deal back when the park first, first opened. You could go in there and actually listen to the people that lived in that community, and it made it a, a really nice event for people to come and see. Stephen, before you go on, Blue Heron is where the railroad goes to. The yes. railroad stops here, and it was an old mining camp. Yes, right. that's correct. This is the bookstore and the vending machines closed. And this, this is one of the buttons that you would push to have an interactive experience in, e in each one of the structures. You can kind of see that it's, it's there's some dire need of some maintenance and repair. Uh, tourists that would come in this area, especially, I'm, I'm in that area all the time because I grew up there and I spent a lot of time there. And a lot of the tourists that I see or speak to, they, they don't like seeing this. I mean, it is a very beautiful place to go to if, if it, you know, was took care of properly. This is one of the structures. You can see the, the, the paint falling off and it's just, it's been not well maintained. Next slide. Next slide. As a young man, I had learned to avoid interactions with parks and forest rangers from my personal experiences. Throughout my career, I've had many dealings with the Park Service and Forest Service. In 2007, we built a new intake in Big, at Big Creek inside the park. MCWD has to pay a special use permit for water lines that cross federal lands. We continue to pay $2,600 per year. The release of federal land, some federal lands for economic development is very important to the growth of our community. MCWD has over 95% of our county served with water. The federal lands that don't have access to water, if released, we would work hard to provide those areas with water for economic development. Burning forest areas as a management practice has, been, has a negative impact on the water quality and air quality in our community. If selected trees in the forest were harvested before trees die, it would decrease the need for burn management. The Water District has worked very hard with the Forest Service in the past, in years past, in order to convince better management practices. The prescribed burn, burning creates treatment problems from soil runoff and has more inherent risk to human health and environment, environment than harvesting. Also, it eliminates the possibility of contributing to economic development. I have come to learn that those dealings, those dealings, the outcome, I've come to learn those dealings, the outcome of the interactions with these officials are always dependent upon the individuals I am dealing with. Tim Reed with the Forest Service has been an outstanding person to work with. I appreciate all the work that we've done together and I, I've not had that interaction with, with the Parks are with the Forest Service in the past, and I thank you for that for that help. My hope is for the Park Service and Forest Service to understand just how much of our community is impacted impacted by what they do and what they don't do. Hear how they received and how they can help our community on based on so much of. And I think the water input that you were adding in Big Creek was that to serve the federal prison. That was to so, well serve our community and the federal yes. prison. Yes. So you take water out of the river, comes across forest land, and you have to pay rent yes. to do that. Yep. Well, not only that, the church that you was talking about earlier, we have some churches that are surrounded that has to that the water line going to the church, they have to pay a special use permit for that water as well. Right. 
it seems like that would be a small thing we ought to try to fix as well, you know, that you know, do we really have to have that charge to go across the line. You probably had to build all the pipes, right? Yep. yep. To carry the water. The other thing I'm impressed with how, how beautiful that gorge is, is that, you know, like with Red River Gorge, it does really well tourism-wise. It's a beautiful place. Um, and um, But I'm thinking it's getting a little more attention you know, than this park is. And some of it is the whole idea is for you to go back and when, when money's being apportioned to think about there are some smaller parks like this that uh, could use a little more attention, you know, as far as when we, which way we direct things. I'm up. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> Go that one. <laughs> Brandon Kidd up here is representation for the American Perry County Industrial Development Authority. And so, uh, we can't hear you. Okay. We can't hear you. Can't hear me. Can I hold that mic? Yes, I can. Yeah. So I can't stand up. I'll speak up. Uh, see if it comes better. I'm Randy Kidd, and I'm here representing McCurry County Industrial Development Authority. This isn't a lynching for you guys, okay? We love our Daniel Boone National Forest and our National Park Service. We, too, want to preserve the beauty this county has to offer. However, when you sit down across the table from a, a group of caring people in this community, and you look at that map and say, what economic development opportunities do we have? It's very disheartening, okay? And so we're not trying to do away with, we've, we've, we're here with an open dialogue to find out, can we partner? Can we partner with you to take advantage of the beauty that we have in our community? And so I'm going to have to leave the mic for a minute because I wanted to point out a few areas. I'll try to speak up. Is that better? I too have lived here all my life, uh, grew up, lived a mile and a half out the road, and so I witnessed a lot throughout my years. I remember being a teenager working in my dad's grocery store, and the newspaper come out, and I may be off on the numbers, but it was large in 1980-something, $1.2 million payroll, gone. And that was our mining industry. It left us, as in the 80s. Well, the National Park Service came through during that same time, give or take some years, right? And to a county that was already weak and depressed, we start to see hope of preservation within our lands, although you met resistance. My family owned 400 acres inside the National Park. We didn't reside there, but it was three generations, okay? And I know there was resistance for that, but... We finally came to terms that, hey, okay, preservation is going to be good. Look at all the opportunities that we may have as a community to take advantage of such beauty. And we're talking about lodging. We're talking about our tourism. We're talking about many facets that would help our community grow. And so from the 80s, we learned that the locals were not wanted inside National Park Service. Now, I'm sure that wasn't your perception. You've been there a long time. But that was what was portrayed to us. Okay? If you were from Ohio, Indiana, California, it seemed as you were welcomed with more open arms than the ones that lived here. What's my point? My point is oppression is what we started to learn. Oppression is what we started to know. So why are we here today? We're here today to open up this dialogue that we didn't know existed. We had no idea that we could have this conversation until Senator Rand Paul brought it to us. We thank you all for being here. We're not trying to lynch you. We are trying to partner with you and express our concerns. Okay? 
All right, so there's been many slides pointed out already in terms of economic development on the north end of the county surrounding Highway 27. Again, we're not trying to do away with Daniel Boone National Forest. We're just saying, could we have some of that to try to help our community grow? We want the same thing. We want people to come here and enjoy it as much as you all do because it benefits us more than it does you. Everybody agree with that? Good. So that, that's what our ask is. You know, we're, we're not trying to ask these great lump sums of, of land and do away with the forest. We're just trying to, to get an opportunity to utilize them. Okay? And so those, those portions pointed out along Highway 27, we feel like, could help us. As you see, <coughs> Kentucky is our only opportunity, land mass-wise, for growth. Right? Pulaski County, Lake Cumberland, is a huge tourism place. And so our thought process is, how can we grow our north, or utilize our north, to meet them halfway? Right? Whether that be by someone wanting to, to build a home in our beautiful area and enjoy Lake Cumberland, or whether someone wants to put a business along 27 that leads them into the gateway, or so we thought was the gateway years ago, into the National Park Service. Now our judge pointed out that if you try to reference the National Park Service, the majority of it will take you into Tennessee. I'm going to tell you that's probably back in the 80s we'll take some of that responsibility. Maybe our community didn't wasn't as active. But again, remember, we just went through this weakness of the largest payroll in our community moving out, closing down, right? So we was already weak, and so we were struggling. We were struggling. But now, now we have a voice, and, and you know, thanks, Senator Paul, and you guys so much for being here, to be able to open up this dialogue, okay? But, so, things that I had looked at proposing, you talked about special use with the, the National Forest Service, right. correct? This, oh my goodness, what's the, what is that? Okay. <laughs> Here's the big south fork that meets the Daniel Boone National Forest on the Peters Mountain Trail end, okay? This is where I grew up. What an opportunity we would have because you have to go into Tennessee in order to utilize this land. Okay? There is there is nothing here that access well you can access by, you know, a horse or by foot trail into the gorge and it's a long it's a long walk, you know. And so we were thinking about this Daniel Boone National Forest. Well it is touch screen and okay. <laughs> The Daniel Boone National Forest possibly releasing, if that's special use, that's awesome. To where maybe somebody has an opportunity to go in there and build a, a lodging. You know, maybe someone, you have your Sheltoe Trace Outfitters in Whitley County. You know, maybe we could have our own Sheltoe Trace Outfitters, of course, a different name, or maybe they wanted to partner and actually access all the beauty that we have you know, to the river and to the to the hiking trails. But think about this. Peters Mountain Trailhead comes up. You are over 20 miles away before you get to an opportune place to be able to access that through tourism efforts. That's a long way. I love our Mine 18, you know, and I appreciate what the Park Service did. But in all honesty, when you go down to Blue Heron one time, you're finished. You don't want to go back. Why? Because you see the steel structures with the button to push, and you walk through it. You get to see the, you know, the tipple, which was done great. Uh, but th there's really nothing else to. When you're at Blue Heron, you're up high, and the gorge is down below you. Yeah. No, you're river. actually right on the South Fork. Oh, you are down the river. Yeah. Yep. And uh, would that be a good place to, to have like a lodge, like a bed and breakfast that rented out canoes and kayaks and things there? Was that the most likely place to put something? Well. Because the train's already going there? That's where the train goes, right? Yeah, but uh, I think 
that to truly access and to wrap up our tourism efforts inside our community, our access points, one of them would be potentially Peters Mountain, okay? The other one would be what you call the Ledbetter Properties, if you're all familiar with that. It's on the Bald Knob side. That property is elevated. It was, it was a homeland until the Park Service, they bought it, the family moved, but it's still sort of an open field. But there are river access points that I think could be opened up at, at those two locations. And there's already roads there or not roads there? There is. There's an old fire break road at the Ball Knob, and it goes into what we call locally as Ship Rock. Right. How hard is that? If a community wrote you a letter and said, we want to do that, how hard is that to make that happen? Well, I guess what I would like to propose is that we, you know, we have expertise in our offices, we have community planners, and that we sit down with you all and talk about your vision we get that you need economic opportunities i would like to see at least three of those kids in the future stand up and say they've had jobs with the federal government yeah. and some of them want to pursue careers in conservation so we can sit down and talk to you we'd have to go through a planning process to do that it doesn't have to be a 12-year uh, bureaucratic process but to you know really sit down with the community and talk about you I think I'm sure I can speak for Ken the Absolutely. Forest Service joining in and figuring out some some solutions to it yeah so how many public access you say there's more access to the park in Tennessee as you look at this big swath of, of uh, parkland how many public access points are there well it, it depends right now. on what you refer to public access points because most of them you can walk in well, the blue heron you can get to by getting on the train here and going to it right yeah, but that's 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 the stop now there's trails all over the place my but is that the number one for somebody who's going to drive into the community and wants to get into the park is blue heron the way to i mean you have to get on the train that's the main way to get into the park uh, rather than walking a long line drive you can drive the road drive. follows the 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 trail the train trail and you can actually drive into the blue heron okay but what? that's the blue heron but other than that are there other ways to drive into the park or to get into the park other than walking in no no the you know and one of my references is what they call the bear creek area uh it's the shortest distance to the river so when you're at the top of, of the bear creek which is just around from the horse camp okay uh there's a road it used to be a road that crossed Potch Creek and actually ended up in Tennessee, not so right. far over. But, you know, if that road was open for vehicle use, you could stop it at the bottom. You're at, you're at the river, you know, for rustic campsites. But it would give us an opportunity because there are private lands in behind that point, okay? It would give someone an opportunity to go in and, and maybe establish a campsite, right. you know, privately owned. Or, or what are the odds of this happening? If they came to you with this idea, I mean, what are the odds that this could happen? Does this happen in other parks where you have new park uh, access? I mean, it sounds to me reasonable that Tennessee's got a lot of access to this park. The parks are supposed to be for people to go to them, right? Absolutely. We're committed to, to good access, and, um, you know, we can... We've probably done planning here in the Kentucky side before. We can reinvigorate that, and we can look at the whole concept of access. And, and let's say they wanted, let's I don't know where it should be, but let's say at Blue Heron there's a renovation and someone wants to put a lodge in there. Can you just sort of give permission and then they shop it around or you shop it around to try to find an entity that would actually build it? Is it a public-private partnership where a private entity can come in and build there with your permission, or is it done by the Park Service to build a lodge? Who, who builds the lodge? If it's on our property, we have concessions law, so we would then, you know, there could um, be a private a entity. Prospectus, and it would, it would definitely be a private entity. But it seems like if the community it. wanted to pursue that, what they need is, okay, there's a, a section there where there used to be a you know, some kind of pavilion or something, you give them the right to, to rebuild something on there and it has to be with your permission, but then they start looking around at national companies, you start looking around, they try like economic development, that's the job. They start looking for somebody, they come in and put it there, but the first thing is they can't look for a company that wants to build a lodge there until you give them permission to build it, you know what I mean? 
Right, so we would need to do some kind of planning process to look at access and make sure that there's demand for that, and right. I mean, we, we can do all but of do that. Other, but do other local communities do stuff like this? Yes. Is this happening around the country? We work collaboratively with communities all the time, and maybe we should... Right, and the thing is, is that as far as whether there's enough use, maybe that decision is somewhat made by can they convince a company that no company's going to come in well, and build that lodge. That's yeah. part of it. Is that's looking you know. at the feasibility who could come in and is it going to be cost effective for right. them? And, yeah. and then I guess my hope is that it wouldn't take years and years of, of planning that we could expeditiously get to it. And it's just sort of like, I think you're hearing from community leaders, but I think the community at large wants something like this. And that's just my hope is that when we leave here, and I know sometimes it can be kind of strident that we're criticizing, but at the same time we want it to be better. And uh, if you would take away and try to do kind of what the people want, and not hopefully go back and say oh, we're not going, you know, we're in charge, they're not in charge, it's our land, not their land. That's kind of the, that's the like Stephen was saying, this this idea of resistance. And I don't think that's this is the first I, time you've ever heard that. I you know? agree. And if we can't do something, we should be able to clearly articulate why we can't do that. Right. If it's law or policy, then we right. can come to your office. And right. And really, I think my goal is that it should be that you want to do what they want, not that you don't want to. You know that there's a resistance that you really want to help them and. And like I say, they don't. Nobody here wants to destroy the park. They want access to the park, so people would come in through and stop at their gas stations and their restaurants on the way to going into the park. You know. And you know, I have to point this out uh, to you, Senator Paul. Uh, this is the Park Services. I don't know what to call it. The U.S. Code. Right. On when they brought lands in or when they started purchasing lands. Um, it's it's going to have to be changed some at the top you know some of this is potentially going to be out of their hands you know well that's what i want to hear too i mean yeah. is the honest truth if it if, if none of this is going to happen and we have to change the law tell us and we'll try to change the law but we're not we're, we shouldn't be on opposite sides here nobody wants to destroy the park you know people want access to the park and that's the whole thing is that the irony of seeing all these signs that you know no access and there's a bar across the road we should be doing the opposite. We should be trying to have more open roads and seeing what we can do. And the county it sounds like they even, with the limited resources they have, would clear roads to get right. people in, you know, to the parks. So and I the forest. Put you on the spot. No, I, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. I, Could we have a discussion about opening a road for vehicle access that is currently closed? Absolutely, we can always have a discussion. I have to become familiar with the legal uh, requirements there, and we can easily tell you why or why not we can't do that. I know that some of the roads were closed in the enabling legislation for the park, but certainly we can talk about that, hear your needs, and if if we can't do it, we'll tell you why we can't. And then right. there's always and if it gets to that, and there was some legal reason, enabling legislation, whatever, and you tell, if you'll be honest with the local people and tell them we, we think our hands are tied, it's not that we don't want to help, but we can't legally, we'll try to change the law. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do is listen to what we want from my perspective, not yours, and try to change the law to make it happen. Um, so, but let us know that. So then yeah. they can tell me they want the law Absolutely. changed and I can try to and we'd like you know, to get the law changed. with you again as a team and, and with the Forest Service and kind of talk about your economic goals. And, you know, maybe we have some ideas yeah. too. Right. We at least want to fully understand where you're coming from. That's great. And, you know, could we have a discussion about jointly working together potentially, special use if you call it that, of opening that land for to be bought by a private sector or something else. I don't know what else there would be. You know, I, I'm a firm believer the private sector can, can do great things, you know. And so could we have that discussion? Absolutely, Mr. Kidd. We'd be glad to have the discussion in, in partnership with the Park Service. Uh, uh, Secretary Sonny Perdue of USDA announced a shared uh, stewardship uh, initiative back in August of last year. And that's for us to work closely with state and local governments to achieve common goals. And, uh, and, and we're certainly open to have those discussions. Going back to the Highway 27 for a little bit, the commercial stuff, um, it, just giving us advice on what to do. If we applied, you, didn't, you think it's very unlikely we'd get a special use permit to get a commercial corner there and be able to uh, build a 
gas station or a Cracker Barrel or something I, like I that? I think it depends on what's proposed, and, and, and we would just have to work through the process. Because you're not aware of it happening in other places. It's not a common occurrence. Now, for something like a school, the, the, the land at the right. McCreary County Elementary School, there's specific legislation that allows us to convey and land. So do you think you school. have the legal ability to grant it and it's just uncommon to grant it, or do you think we'd have to change the law to change your uh, the way you assess where the land can go? Well, I think the legal ability is there. It's a matter of working through the process and getting public input from a citizen far away from here, you know, we have to consider all of that in, uh, feedback in the process. What about a uh, potential industrial site? Of course, that's an agency of the, the county government, right? Right. Would that potentially fall in? Potentially. Let's have the discussion, make the proposal, and, and we'll, uh, we'll identify and outline the process. Yeah. And again, I want to go back to my point. We love the National Park Service. We love the Band of Danville National Forest. Okay, and our sole purpose of being here is to try to figure out. We felt oppressed for years. Now we're trying to figure out how can we work together. True. That's all we ask. I thank you all for being here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Good job. Mr. Stevens. My name is Jerry Stevens. I'll be brief. Everybody's read the set here a long time. I'm going to a whole different route. I'm going to talk about the mismanagement of the timber. Uh, there's two or three hundred million dollars worth of standing timber on the Daniel Boone National Forest. My, my estimates are conservative. Uh, you could cut three to five million dollars a year. I know you're cutting a little bit, very little. You could cut three to five million dollars worth of revenue to the Forest Service and cut 12, 15 million feet of timber. Uh, it's dying at a lot faster rate than it's growing. I've been here 58 years. I've been in cutting some kind of wood for 45 years. Administrators come and go. We live here. There's DNA back through this crowd that their second and third generation has been in the timber business. Um, it's real money. It's millions and millions of dollars that's there that needs cut. Uh, I have a staving heading mill in Pine Knot I sell exclusively to Brown Foreman. You know how hot the bourbon business is. Uh, there's all kinds of timber that's over mature, that's dying, and there's no middle timber and young timber coming on. Very little. Uh, a little bit is being cut, very little, but it's dying and uh, a lot faster than it's growing. In your business, do you actually do, in your business, the logging, you apply for permits and you uh, yes, do logging yes. in the National Forest? I used to cut a lot of timber in the 80s and 90s on the Daniel Boone National Forest. I've cut private and public timber all over the county. Uh, I've hunted. I know the forest, you know. I went out last, yesterday evening, me and my son, and looked around to see how much a certain area had deteriorated in five years. Right. Uh, and you say used to. It used to be easier to get a permit. To oh, yeah. It used to be there was 12 to 15 logging crews working in the 80s and 90s. Right. Now they sell probably a million feet a year. Okay. The, and I guess then my question, Jerry, In, the, in, the, in you, McCoy County, you sell 3 million feet a year? Uh, or, or the... Fiscal year 18 was about 6,000, uh, 6, yeah, around 3. So that range. Okay. But, so but, I guess my question is, uh, what's the change from the 80s and 90s to now, and is that legal, a philosophy of the forestry, or what, what's changed? Well, I think, I think uh, reduction in timber harvest is, is, is down mostly across the country on national forest lands, but, but we're really taking a, a close look at this, and under the umbrella of improving forest conditions, we know that we need to do more active management than we're currently doing. Because it sometimes right. helps the forest it, to it helps trees. The forest replenish and and certainly in the southeast trees grow relatively fast compared to other parts of the country so it's important that we harvest certainly we're not at the level that we were in the 80s and 90s but we're up some from what we were a few years ago and and i predict the trend to go up even more under the umbrella of improving forest conditions for wildlife habitat all the other ecological values that uh, that we manage forests for 
and uh, as well as the economic value to the local community, such as yourself, your business. When you and take others. the trees out, does that reduce reduce the risk of uh, forest fires? Well, it can, <laughs> but we do use, and I know the comment was made about the impact for fire, but we do use some fire in a planned way, and that reduces the impact right. of fire more so than just removing the trees. But removing the trees and the smaller uh, diameter things especially does help with catastrophic fire. But anyway, I know there's a lot of red tape involved with the red cockaded woodpecker and all the other BS, you know. but. I know, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, you know, I, I told them the southern pine beetle was coming a year before it got here, and it killed millions and millions of dollars. Absolutely, worth. No, not, yeah. A healthy forest is fine economically advantageous and environmentally and advantageous. A growing middle to young timber is a lot more better for the environment than decaying trees are. You know, it just, it, it makes no sense to me, and I'm not, I'm not saying, I know there's a lot of red tape to do anything. It's just there's so many millions of dollars just in Macquarie County that's not being used. That's, that's, that's just, and it's, I think it's, it's falling a, down, it's dying, it's falling a, down. It's a pendulum between the environment and economic, and you can have both, and I think some of this probably isn't the law. It's either your judgment or your boss's judgment or your boss's boss. Somebody makes a decision on how much we're doing, and I think what, what Jerry's saying is we want the pendulum to swing back a little more towards being concerned with the economy down here and uh, that that is real money. That's not government giving Absolutely. people down here money. That's them earning their money and uh, creating jobs. Well, if it's managed, it'll never run out. You know, right. you know, you can have it on an 80-year cycle or whatever cycles you right. want to do. It helps everybody. You know, it's, it's a no, I don't understand. Well, Any of change be. between the 80s and 90s, new legislation that we passed or more attitude towards forest or reduced demand for trees or endangered species? Endangered species. Well, endangered species, but, uh, and we do, uh, and there's, there's a balance there. You know, we can manage and have healthy forests and still maintain good habitats for healthy species. That's, that's what I'm saying, yeah. is they use the Endangered Species right. Act, the environment. But, but there are some ridiculous things, and I'll, I'll give you one ridiculous example, because I'm probably more with Jerry than anybody else on this. <laughs> Uh, we reduced Lake Cumberland for a year or two to repair the dam. We had to do that. So we go to put the water back in the dam, and these crazy people say, well, the sna we found the snail darter, or the dirt darter, and we can't put water back in the lake. And it's like, the water's been in the lake since the 1930s. The government took our land, created the lakes, now we're happy with the lakes, and now you tell us we can't have the lake back because somebody found a snail darter. A lot of the endangered species stuff is, is actually poor science. And the, I'll give you an example. The pocketbook mussels, a pain in, in the you-know-what. They're everywhere. The original studies were done in six or seven places. Everywhere you've looked since then, like 40 other places we keep finding it, it's not endangered. But like the government is so uh, stuck in its way, we can't get them off the list. And this is the problem. And so everywhere we go, like that sewage plant over in, on Kentucky Lake, we had to do a, a mussel book. And it's like, which would you rather, human feces in your lake or, you know, but we do a study on the pocketbook muscle and somebody gets rich off counting them and then we do a, a arrowhead study and they still build the, the new sewage plant because it makes sense to have a bigger sewage plant that doesn't dump, you know, excrement in the lake. So you can see how we get very frustrated at, at, at government, you know, and the lack of response to these things. And uh, we should protect endangered species, but we shouldn't do crazy stuff either, you know. If you harvest parts of those areas in the forest, would that cut down on the amount of prescribed burning that you guys do? Probably not. Uh, I mean, prescribed burning is needed in some forest ecosystems to benefit the forest. And, uh, and, and harvest is one treatment on the land, prescribed burning is another. Sometimes they go hand in hand, sometimes maybe not. But uh, uh, we know, you mentioned the white oak and the stave industry and that business, and we know that many of the more desirable species are less common in the forest now than they were several decades ago. And we do studies all across the South to know that's true. And fire is a role in that, in that a lot of the more thin bark species are more prevalent now, like red maple is a common species here that was not as common four or five decades ago. So fire helps with those situations and gets the more desirable species. Is there a blight that's uh, come around the last year or two? I remember seeing well, something about that. There's the, uh, the emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer. Has killed at least two-thirds of all the ash in 
the Stearns district. Right. Um, okay. At least two thirds. What, what happens? It's, it's not it's managed. It's an insect of some sort. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a non-native insect. What, what happens? Right. It's it's where it's not managed. Insects come in to the dying trees, and then more insects come. It's right. just it, it it's a like a living uh, a living being. When they get down, they get more disease. Right. Every living being eventually dies. Right. You know. Are, are you? Are, do you think you're hearing enough in your job or in Washington from the side of the, of the economic side? Yes, I know you're here from the environmental side. Yes. But are you hearing from the economic side? Yes, sir. Uh, it's not that the water district has. You know, we understand that you have to do some burning, uh -huh. but we have data that shows the the water and air quality, that how much it's impacted by what you guys do on your prescribed burns. So in my, in my position is I would like to start up a dialogue with you guys. We've talked about it in the past. We've kind of gotten away from it a little bit. And I'd like to get back with you guys on doing prescribed burning in, a, in our zone one protection areas to where it helps protect our community. And also let's limit the amount of the overall size of your prescribed burns because there are times, and people here will attest to this, when you guys are doing some burns, our entire county turns, I mean, we have to sh close our doors and the whole county turns into a, nothing but a big smoke bomb. And so if we can work together to limit the total overall amount of acreage that you guys are burning and do it more frequently or, or something of that nature to where the soil erosion is not as bad and the air quality is not as bad, that's something that I would like to see us work towards. We'll be honored to have those discussions. Okay. In fact, as it relates to human health and prescribed fire, we're having a lot of discussions with the Center for Disease Control now related to that and a balance there. Okay. Yeah. All right, anybody else? Uh, do you want to take a question or two from the audience when we do that? Anybody have a question or something they'd like to say? Yes. Are you for, tell us who you are and if you're from here or not. My name is Olivia and I moved here because McCurry County is one of the most biodiverse places in the nation. Um, I just want, if any development happens, a thorough uh, economic impact to each area that you're proposing. I am totally for access to the park. I work for Big South Fork. I think it's an amazing opportunity for the community. I think people should go there. I think it's something we should be proud of. Um, the only thing that I would really like to see happen with any of this development um, is a precise plan, and that means not bulldozing through. Not, like you said, you want it to happen like that. If it happens like that, you're going to go over these important steps of what you're actually impacting. I know you think it's ridiculous that we have these um, things in place to protect things like the woodpecker. However, it's there for a reason. And if we just, like I said, pull those through because we think it's for the greater good of development, that's such an anthropocentric point of view. That's not taking into consideration the things that are connecting this place that right. is literally one of the most biodiverse places in the nation. But you realize that nobody's really talking about getting rid of the park or the forest. We're talking about tiny little yes. bits. In fact, but like on 27, if we look at like a couple acres, 10 or 20 acres on Highway 27. That 10 or 20 acres past that, that buffer zone is well, here, now I'm just talking about the first 10 or 20 acres right along right along the highway. You can't even measure the percentage of that is of the forest. We're talking about 0.00001%. It's not a, All I'm so, saying is that you can say it's not going to have an impact, but if it's near a stream, which this entire county is near a stream, right. if it is near a stream, it's going to impact that buffer zone that's right there. Right. And it's going to affect it right. not much further. So anything that you propose, like you said, having public input, thank you. Uh, thank you. Because the community needs to know what happens and how it's going to affect everybody. I'm all for more jobs here. I'm lucky enough to have a job here to stay here. And these students here, I wish they were here right now. You're proposing a gas station and a cracker barrel aren't going to keep any of those kids here. <coughs> I would disagree. Uh, anybody else? Yes. I'd like to address a, a question to Mr. Ken Arnold. Sure. My question is, uh, I'm more of a private land person. I want to know something about what you have to call a proclamation boundary. 
what is this population mountain that the Dayton Blue National Forest has? It's kind of uh, sprawled, but it's larger than our county. It seems that it engulfs our county completely. And is there regulation uh, that's attributed to that proclamation mountain? Well, when national forests were originally established back many decades ago, uh, each national forest had a defined proclamation boundary, which defined the area in which the federal government could acquire land. And in most cases, we don't own all of the land within those defined proclamation boundaries. In the southeast, the defined proclamation boundaries is about a total of 25 million acres. We own about 13.3. So we own about half the land within those proclamation boundaries. And it's simply a description of the forest in which we have the authority to acquire or trade or whatever land. Mm -hmm. So there's no regulation on the private landowners no, within that proclamation. No, no regulation in the Forest Service. Has. No regulation. No, so if I wanted to build a pond on my land, is there a regulation that tells me how deep I can build that pond? Not that the Forest Service has. Now, some other entity may, but I'm not aware of anything the Forest Service. If I had to guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy out in Wyoming who built a cattle pond. He got a local permit from the local government, put a little dam. The water still ran out of it. The pond was about 50 yards by 50 yards. The EPA fined him $37,000 a day. He finally went to the Supreme Court and won, but no one would listen to him. It was a beautiful little pond with deer and eagles and everything came to his pond. And uh, so I'd be very careful and I'd ask four different levels of government and get an attorney before I did anything <laughs> to my own land anymore. So, Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Thank you for being here. Maybe one more. Somebody struck a master here, District 3. I'd sent this to uh, uh, Brian. It's uh, our side of Tillman Falls. There's 440 acres on our side of Falls. When you cross in our side, our side is dead. There's nothing down there on our side of Falls. All the way you get to Whitley and Stearns. And there's 440 acres right across from the Falls here. William's wife, Peggy, actually found this by accident and gave it to me. But if we could get something here, sell it part of this, so we could put, you could put a restaurant, a motel, we could look over the Falls, that would be great. And, and this, is, this is in, in the park? This fix out part? Okay. Yeah, I think these are great ideas. Y'all have to just keep talking. I don't know enough yeah. about the geography to. It's hard for me, but figuring that out, figuring out the process to ask for permission, and then I think we've started dialogue, and I hope we can get somewhere. And then I hope from this meeting today, what I want for my staff and from local government is that we talk over the next six months or so and let's see what happens over the next six months if we get progress but what I hate to do is get it started and then all of a sudden it falters and nobody ever follows right. up so I want to know if we have some success if the federal government is working with you on this and um, and if we get to an impasse and they just can't or won't do it then let's talk about changing the law to get it done um, but I, I think there are ways to have both the you know the environment and, and the economy doing well and I think we can do better with the economy here than we've done at use of utilizing our land and trying to get to tourism and access. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks for the panel and thanks for the community for coming out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.